Everyone, thank you so much for joining us here at the next session of the ongoing Founders U University Education Series, uh, where we bring uh, experts in various topics, everything from business operations, marketing, startups, uh, raising capital, et cetera, to speak to uh, founders in these cohorts. So thank you so much for joining us in person and online. We're really excited for uh, Liz. Liz has been a regular supporter of ours, so we're really happy to have her. Liz is a national sales expert and the founder and CEO of Regarding Sales. Her firm focuses on building B2B sales operating systems that drive extraordinary growth. Uh, Liz uses a lot of strategy and processes to create a roadmap for success that focuses on clients. On, it focuses clients on getting the results they need. Liz also has a, a master's degree from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and a bachelor's degree from the University of California, Davis. Uh, Liz is experienced in international econ uh, uh, political economist. She's a well-schooled in digging through the data to interpret results. Her unique background combined with her focus and strategy process, Liz delivers ex exceptional quality uh, to her clients and concrete solutions for difficult sales problems. Liz is very, very, very well versed in a myriad of topics. And today she's going to dive into the business model canvas and strategic planning. Liz has quite a bit of experience uh, in working in a uh, strategic scope for many of her clients and in many businesses. So without much further ado, Liz, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you being here. I will stop sharing my screens and uh, lend the floor to you. Thank you so much. So thanks everyone for joining us. I'm really, I'm always excited to be here. I love working with entrepreneurs. To me, that's, um, you know, there's lots of business going out in the world, but entrepreneurs are where the excitement and the fun is. And I love your passion and I'm glad you're here. So let's see if we can. Um, so today we're going to talk about growth through strategy. I'm Liz and you've already got an introduction, but my mission is to take the mystery out of sales and to make sales manageable and predictable. And a big part of that is the higher level strategy because you will always have chaos in your sales if you have chaos in your business and if you have chaos in your strategy. So what we want to do is eliminate chaos. And one of the ways that we do that is we create strategy and then we create processes to support that. Okay, so let's talk about this idea of a business model canvas. And now you guys are welcome to interrupt, to ask questions, to respond. And I'm just wondering, of all of you that are with us today, how many of you have either started your business model canvas or worked on your business model canvas, or at least know what a business model canvas is? It would be good to have a sense of that. All right, I don't know if we got any answers, but I'm guessing some of you have started working on a business model canvas. Some of you maybe haven't, some of you may be struggling. It's actually a pretty easy tool. So I wanna walk through it with you. So let's start with this idea of what is a business model canvas? So this idea that you can tell your story on one sheet, as opposed to telling your story um, in pages and pages of noise. So we need a strategic plan, but to be able to narrow it down to something that's easy to see and read and understand is brilliant. So I love this idea of the business model canvas. Um, why is it important? Because it, in a very clear way, helps you create the overall strategy and the messaging and the critical pieces that you need to drive your sales and to drive your business. So how does it differ from a business plan? Well, a business plan tends to be long, uh, tends to be wordy, tends to be um, very detailed. And those are important. A business plan is important. A strategic plan is important. But this right now is a very high level, manageable tool for getting together the critical information about your business. Once you do the business model canvas, you can begin to work on a more in-depth strategy or more in-depth business plan. Um, and if you want to, I've got these websites here strategizer.com and canvanizer.com. Both of them have the business model canvas available that you can download and, and uh, fill out. I'm going to uh, show it to you on the slides though. Okay, um, so we're gonna start with what are the things that your business model canvas does? The first and the most important thing is to define, define the value that you create for your customers. We get really focused on our product, but our product, believe it or not, is absolutely unimportant to our client. What's important to them is their problems and how we solve it. 
And so one of the things that the business model canvas helps you do is to, to figure out where you are creating value for your client. Um, it will help you think about who your, who your ideal customer is. Whoops, and I went too far. And it will help you define and quantify your market. So one of the things that we get stuck in as entrepreneurs, and I want to make sure you guys don't do this, is we tend to think everybody can purchase from me. And therefore, I should be selling to everybody. And one of the most important things for a successful business is to be really clear about who your ideal customer is and where you're most likely to have the greatest success. People are most likely to pay for your product without com complaining about it. Um, most likely to buy from you again. So we want to identify that part of the market where we really can have the best leverage and the best results. <clears throat> and we want to define a profit, a profit, profitable revenue model. So it's not enough to have a good idea. It's not enough to solve a problem. Until you're making money, you have a hobby rather than a business. And so the business model canvas is going to help you do all of these things. Okay. We did, how does it, oh, wait, well, let me just rephrase this. How does it, how does it differ from a business plan? It's a summary view, it's customer market focused, and it's quick and easy to change. One of the things that founders say to me all the time is, I don't want to create a strategy because then I'm stuck. And, and uh, to me, that is absolutely the furthest thing from the truth. The reason we do our business model canvas, the reason we create strategy is because it helps us build a story and a picture and an understanding of what needs to happen. When you need to pivot, which often companies do, you need to understand what is going to be impacted when you pivot, whether it's a big pivot or a small pivot. And if you have a plan and you're really clear, then you can look at all of the things that will be impacted by the pivot and make sure that you adjust accordingly. So it's not written in stone. It's easy to change. It's easy to do. And I want to jump right in and let's start doing it. So your business model canvas has nine pieces, a value proposition, and I'm going to go through all of these in depth, a customer, um, a statement of who your customer is, what channels you're going to be selling through, um, who your customer segments are, what your revenue strategy is, what your key resources are, what your key activities are, who your key partners are, and your cost. This is it. That's all that's going to be on your business model canvas. So this is what it looks like. Um, it usually does not have these colors. These are my colors. Um, but this is basically, not basically, this is it. This is the whole thing. And everything you need to say fits right here. So this is what it looks like. You can go to strategizer.com and download it. You can also find it in other places. Like, for instance, if you use Lucidchart, this is a Lucidchart version of it. Um, but there, you can download it. There are lots of places where you can get this. And it's free, so download it if you haven't. Okay, so there's really three parts to your business model canvas. There's the internal and the external. So we're gonna talk about the internal in blue and the external in yellow. Um, so these are all of the, the things about my product and my company, and these external are all about my clients and my channels, okay? And the last piece is a value proposition. And um, the value proposition, I actually want to come back to it later. But the value proposition is sort of the part that ties the two together, the internal and the external, because it's about the linking together of the problem your customers have and how you solve it. So that's why it sits here in the middle, which you can't see the green here. It sits here in the middle between your cost centers and your profit centers, because it's the link between your internal business and your external um, customers. It's why they're buying from you and why you have a business. So we're going to go back to this later, but when I talk about value propositions, so the typical way that people talk about value proposition is what problem are you solving? How is it better? And the way I talk about it is more specific, and we're going to play with this later on, but my customer's problem in their words, how I solve it, and why I'm the best solution for my ideal customer. So remember I said a few minutes ago, Oh, I can sell to everybody. And you need to decide who you're selling to. So um, in, in this case, our ideal customer is who we're going to focus on. And if I know who my ideal customer is, then I know the answer to why am I the best solution for them for solving this problem. Okay, so let's focus on the external for a minute, because really, um, without the external, the internal is irrelevant. 
I'm going to say that again, without the external, the internal is irrelevant. You can have the best product in the world, but if you're not really clear about who you're selling it to and why they're buying it and how you're going to sell it, you don't have a business. So let's start by thinking about the external. Then we can go back and think about the internal and how we're going to support it. So the external is what we call the profit centers. This is where the money comes in. This is the part that changes you from having a, a hobby to a business. So the first thing we want to talk about is customer relationships. Whoops. I just do that all the time. Um, all right. So, and by the way, like I said before, you can ask questions anytime. So if you want to ask questions, now's a good time to throw them up there and we'll, as we're starting this next section. So the customer relationships, it's how do you talk to your market about your solution and how do you acquire customers? So it's, it's a different way of thinking about the world because what you're really thinking about is in order for me to have a business, I have to have a relationship with my customers. They have to know about me. They have to know how to find me. They have to understand what I do and what problem I solve. And they have to be, if they decide to, they have to have a way to buy from me. And if they decide to buy from me, they have to have a good relationship with my company, meaning they have to be happy with what they've purchased. And if they need customer service, all of those things. So when we're selling, we don't just have customers, we have customer relationships. Um, and we have to think about all of those steps. So it's not enough to just know who's going to buy from you. You have to know how. You have to know how they're going to buy from you. You have to know why they're going to buy from you. And you have to know how you're going, they're going to find you and how they're, you're going to find them. Um, so that's the customer relationship part that's in this top left-hand corner. So what are you going to fill in here? You're going to fill into this part how you're, how you're going to um, introduce your market to your solution and how they're going to buy from you, right? What words are you going to use? How are they going to relate to your company? Are they going to be part of a, of a um, community? Are they just going to go walk into Walmart and buy from you? How, how, you know, how are you building this relationship with your customers? How are they finding you? How are they buying from you? Um, how are you going to market to them? The next thing is called channels. Now, some companies will sell through a channel. And some companies will not. So what is a channel? So we talk about channel in a couple of different ways. One way to talk about channel is um, retail channels. So if you sell through a retail store like Michael's or Best Buy or um, even Amazon or Walmart, those, that's, a, that's a retail channel. Amazon is an online retail channel. So that's one kind of channel that you could be selling through. Another kind of channel you could be selling through is um, you could have a retail, you could have a partner that goes out and sells your product. So let's say, for instance, you sell software that goes with a type of hardware. Well, the people who sell that hardware will probably sell your software with it. So you would be selling through a channel um, so that, that your end customer would get your product. Um, you might have a channel that is uh, a distributor. You might have a channel that is uh, like a channel that maybe they, when they sell the hardware, the software is built into it. So, um, I found this on the web. oh, sorry, Siri's talking to me now. Um, so that would be a channel that would package and sell your product to their customers. Um, we also sometimes talk about channels in terms of um Channels being like, are you selling online? Are you selling in person? Are you selling through social media? Um, those would be another way to talk about channels. Uh, so what's really important is to understand how your channel, whether it's a channel partner or whether it's a technology or a way of selling, how your channel is going to deliver your product or solution to your customers. How are they going to find you? So one of the things that people say to me all the time is that we're going to sell through social media. That is not a strategy. That is not a complete solution because you haven't told me how are you going to leverage social media in order for people to buy this from you? How are they going to find you among all of the gazillion other options that they could find? 
And if you're going to sell through retail, how are they going to find you on that retail store? So it's not just who your channel is, but how you're going to leverage the channel so that your customers can find you and buy from you. And then the next piece of this is customer segments. So again, this idea, everybody could buy from me. Well, if you're selling to everyone, you're selling to no one. So what we really want to understand is who are the groups of people who are most likely to buy from you? Who can use your solution? Um, you know, are there lots of them or a few of them? Are there millions and millions of them? Are there several dozen of them? Are there hundreds of thousands of them? Who needs your solution? How many people is it? And, and how are, will they buy? Is, are, is it, are they consumers that, that are going to buy from business to consumer, personal things for their home and their, their own personal use? Is it businesses who are going to buy from you to solve business problems? Um, are you going to have businesses in certain industries or certain sectors? Are you going to have people of certain age group? So as you start to define who your customer segment is, you may have more than one, but you need to be very clear about who it is. I sell to hospital systems of a certain size that have these kinds of doctors. That's my customer segment. Or I sell to um, men between the ages of 18 and 25 who are into sports, right? So we want to be really clear about our customer segment. How do we define the customer who's going to buy from us so that we're able later to figure out what the messaging is um, that we're going to need to use, what the channel is that we're going to need to use in order to sell to them? So if we don't match up, our customer segment with the channel that can reach them, we're going to have a disconnect, we're gonna have a problem. So we wanna be sure that we understand who our customer is, how they buy, who influences their buying decisions, where they shop, where they are online, so that you're using the right channel to reach the right, reach the right customer segment and that you're building the right kind of relationship with them to acquire customers. So one way that people are using relationships now is they have influencers who um, certain buyers have relationships with and trust online, maybe not personal relationships and trust and when they're making buying decisions. So all of these things fit together. Okay, so then the next part of this external is revenue streams. Um, these are your sources of revenue. They can include, whoops, boy, it is so touchy. It can include products, added services, partners, uh, partner relationships. So how, what, what does this mean? A revenue stream is the different ways that I can make money. So for instance, I can sell my actual product to a person face-to-face. -face. That would be a revenue stream and that would be a channel, right? But I could also sell, um, I could sell my product to a distributor and that distributor could pay me for the product and then sell it to their customer. And I could also sell directly to the customer or I could sell through Amazon and have that be one revenue stream. And I can also sell directly on my own website. So revenue stream refers to a couple of different things. One is if you have multiple products or say you have a product and you have software and you have renewals. So you have something physical and you have a software and then you have a renewal. Those might all be different ways to think about revenue streams. Um, but then revenue streams also would be where, is, which kind of channels are the money coming through? So am I selling it, uh, again, directly from my website? Am I selling it uh, through an influencer who's going to sell it on their website? Am I going to pay them a commission? Like, how is the revenue coming into my business? And how many options are there for ways that revenue can come through my business? So for instance, with my business, I have a couple of different revenue streams. One revenue stream is, is teaching programs directly with my clients. Another revenue stream is introducing my clients to other consultants that can help them. And those consultants then pay me a referral fee to introduce them. So that would be two different revenue streams. Um, again, okay, so I, I, a lot of these have two different ways of thinking about them. So I'm trying to share both of them with you. Does revenue stream make sense to all of you? Are you good with this? There's a question right now about how is revenue stream different than a channel, but I think you've semi-addressed that already. 
Yeah, it's a little bit confusing because some of these words are interpreted differently by different people that you're talking to. So I want you to be able to have both definitions. Um, so a channel is how who you're selling through. That is the, the, the out. Like, so I'm selling through Amazon or I'm selling through a channel partner. But when I turn it back around the other direction and I think about how is the money coming into me? So it, it, it can be <clears throat> that the money's coming into me through different channels and I need to understand those as revenue streams, but it could also be that those revenue streams are different product lines that are, create their own revenue. So um, it, that's how I would think about it. It's sort of how, how are you, who are you selling through and then how is the revenue coming in? It's kind of two sides of the same story. Gotcha. And the next question, and then of course, you know, uh, uh, Richard, let, let, uh, let us know if, the, if that was answered sufficiently, if you have any further questions to that. But the next question from Benjamin is, do investors want to see multiple revenue streams, especially early, or do they want us to pick, uh, you know, a single focus revenue stream and, and prove that and prove out that revenue stream before, you know, before expanding, I guess. I think that investors want to see that you understand the whole story of your business. These are my immediate revenue streams. Once this is proven out, I will go to the next revenue stream. So it may be, I might start adding different kinds of products or I might be selling to different um, industries later, or I might start with this channel, which is Amazon and then go to a different channel. So I think that whenever you're presenting to investors, they want to know two things. One is, is there a clear path to revenue and repeatable revenue? And two, is there room for growth? So if you go to an investor and you say, I can sell everything to everybody, they're going to say, I'm not going to invest in you because you don't have a clear path. If, on the other hand, you say, look, here's what I'm going to start. I'm going to start with college students, and then I'm going to start with uh, young families, and then I'm going to go to another group or um, I'm going to start by selling through Amazon, and then I'm going to do something else. Then they see that you see that there are steps to success, that there's um, that there's a logical path, that you're not just going to try and throw it up in the air and, and, you know, or throw spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks. You're going to pick a path, make it successful, but they do want to see what what's the growth path from here. So don't, you know, if I were presenting it, I would present the first one very clearly, and then I would have another slide or another time later on to be able to talk about all of the different ways that the company can grow. So one thing, one, and one example with a lot of SaaS companies right now, or um, uh, even other technology companies right now, is the idea that one, you can be selling a product or a SaaS uh, product, and two, you could be gathering data. Now, it may take you three or five years to gather enough data for it to be valuable to sell, but that would be a revenue stream later on, would be the data that you've been collecting. Now, maybe not collecting on individual people, but but overall data. So um, you don't want to start with saying, I'm going to make all this money selling data because that's not how you're going to start making money. That's something that's going to come later. So I hope I answered that clearly yeah. and I haven't confused you all. Excellent, Liz. Thank you so much. I mean, to basically summarize your points is investors want you to know your business and their proper streams, and they do want it to be validated. So I think there's some initial focus early on, but understanding where your revenue streams might come from later is also important. Thank you. Um, I think I think we only had an additional comments, no additional questions on that point. Thank you. Okay, so then let's look at the internal side. If we understand the external, this is where the money is coming from. This is what makes it a business, not a hobby. Then let's look at the internal part of this. It's really important as we're building our, our businesses to understand what are the real expenses? What is the real cost of doing business? Business, or business people, founders, they underestimate the cost of doing business all the time. They underestimate what's really required to be successful. And so the better you understand what it's going to take internally to support the growth of your business and to deliver your product, the better you will be and the better positions you'll be with investors because they will go, otherwise they're going to look at you and go, yeah, he's underestimated or she's underestimated by about a million bucks. That's a bad underestimation. So let's look at the, the internal side. So 
there's the selling side of it, and then there's the delivery side of it. Um, so in this, we're going to talk about key partners on the delivery, the production and delivery side. So I can go in and produce a product by myself. So let's say I'm developing software and I'm a software developer and I don't need a partner. I can just develop the software. That's fine. But if I'm somebody who has an idea and I need a partner who's a software developer, that needs to be really clear. Or if I'm going to require uh, certain kinds of tools to create it, that I'm going to need a partner who I can trust to support and deliver it. If I'm going to require, let's say I'm making something out of heavy, out of metals, and I'm going to need a partner who can deliver the metal that I need regularly. Who's involved in order for me to produce this? Maybe I have an idea and I can produce some of the parts, but it has to be put together and I need a partner to put it together or package it. Or maybe I'm going to produce the parts in China and that's going to be one of my partners. And then I'm going to have another, we're going to put it together in my own factory, or I'm going to have another factory in the United States that puts it together. These are partners that are required in order to produce or deliver your solution. If, for instance, like I have a training program that I do, I consulting, I can hire other people as partners to help deliver. Um, so these are, this is the part about if I'm producing this product, who are the key partners required in order for me to be successful? And you may be going, well, Liz, those are just vendors. No, it's just vendors. I'm just going to pay vendors. Your vendors are incredibly important. Your relationship with your vendors is incredibly important, especially in the early days of your business. When you have no leverage, you need partners who are going to make you a priority and support you support what you're trying to accomplish. If you're buying something in your vendors, just know all you care about is lowest price. They are not going to support you in the long run and your company is going to suffer. Um, so yes, they may be vendors, but without the partnership of your vendors, you're in trouble. So really think clearly about what is it really going to take to deliver this? Who am I going to have to count on? Who is going to have the ability to undermine my success? And how do I make sure that my partners are in step with me around my success and the success of our business and their success? Um, just like when you're selling to other companies, you don't want them to treat you like crap because you know, you're just a vendor. You don't want to treat your vendors that way. So who are your key partners in success? Your key partners may be advisors. Your key partners may be agencies, your key uh, you know, governmental agencies. They're, they could be consultants. Um, just think about all of the thing, the people that are required, all the partners that are required to deliver what you're doing. Key activities. What do you need to produce, market, and deliver your solution? So uh, we often, when we're building a business, are really clear about what it takes to produce it. I need this many people building this many things. If I'm doing software or I'm a software engineer, I know what the process is to develop it. Where companies really make mistakes is what is the cost of marketing? What is the cost of sales? What is the cost of delivery? Um, it's just not always just, I'll make it and it will somehow magically get into my customer's hands. Usually it's a lot more complicated than that. And there are a lot of activities. If you're selling through a channel, then there's activities that you need to do to find, support, encourage that channel, whatever it is. If you have internal salespeople, if people are going to buy from you online, there's a tremendous amount of effort that goes into creating a marketing strategy and executing a marketing strategy that will help people find you. So what are the key activities that are required to both build, market, and deliver or your solution? I guess that was three things, not two. So key activities is important. Um, you don't have dozens of them there, so you're going to need to put the three or four top, maybe five top uh, activities, and then you can break them down into smaller pieces later. Okay, and key resources. What do you need to have in order to produce, market, and deliver your solution? What relationships do you need to have? You've got that in key partners. What internal um, employees do you need to have? What um, what uh, tools, what software, what um, uh, anything that you need in order to produce, you need to start thinking about it here. What are those resources? Do I need 
Um, do I need relationships? That might also be a resource. Do I need, um, do I need metal? Do I need semiconductors? Do I need, and some of these, again, they may come up in two places because I may actually need semiconductors. So I need a semiconductor uh, partner who I can count on to deliver them to me. Um, but you don't just make out of thin air. Even if you're producing something that is not tangible, you still need resources and expertise and technology in order to develop and deliver. Okay, so how are we so far in cost centers? Are you guys with me? Okay, so the next thing is understanding your cost structure. So we just talked about all of the things that will cost money, right? The resources and the, the technology and the uh, people, that's all gonna cost money. But now we really need to think about what does that actually cost? So, um, and I could do an entire hour long discussion on fixed and variable costs. It's very important to understand these in your business. So um, we talk about fixed costs. Those are the costs that exist uh, regardless of how much you're selling, or at least up to a certain point. So if you have a facility, you have rent. If you have a CEO, you have a salary. If you have uh, computers, that's a cost. If you have um, software required to do what you're doing, that's a fixed cost. So these are the things that are required just to function. Some people call it their nut, right? This is the nut that has to be covered every month because these costs exist, regardless of whether we're selling anything or not selling anything. As long as we're producing, uh, we are having these fixed costs. Now there's two other costs that are variable costs. One is the cost of marketing and sales. So particularly sales varies because if you commission your salespeople, then how much they sell um, determines how much they cost you. So that's a variable cost depending upon how much you're selling. And then there's um, essentially what we call cost of good or COGS, C-O-G-S. And that is, um, that is, I don't have this cost unless I'm selling. So um, if I produce the product, and then I sell it, the cost of producing that product without including accounting and operations and admin and rent, the cost of your product is variable because if I have, if I'm selling a lot, I'm going to make a lot more of it. And if I'm selling a little, I'm going to make a lot less of it. So those costs are going to vary depending upon how much you're selling. What's really important is to be able to divide these up. There's also investment, which we don't have in here, which goes into another category. Um, understanding how to build your budget so that you're, you have your cost of good, your cost of sales and marketing, and your fixed costs um, divided up properly. So you can say, okay, well, if I want to sell this much more, how are my how are my are my fixed costs going to change? And they might because you might have to get another factory or like I had a client who had airplanes and up to a certain point their fixed costs remained the same until they were selling a certain amount when they had to buy another airplane. So that was a new fixed cost that um, but it was based upon that they were selling more. So mostly we're going to talk about what is the fixed cost of running my business. What are the costs of sales and marketing and what's the cost of good? And if I can differentiate those, then I can say, okay, what if I increase production 10%? What if I increase sales 30%? What if I increase 50%? And then I can see how are my costs going to change as I do that? And again, your fixed costs may stay exactly the same or your fixed costs may actually at some point have to increase a little bit in order for your company to support the bigger growth. Did I confuse you all on that or does that make sense? So when we are trying to figure out our projections, our projected growth and our projected revenue, we're talking about the combination of revenue streams and cost structures. So where those two meet is where um, we will know whether we're profitable or not. So um, some, com some companies aren't profitable for the first few years. Some companies 
weren't profitable for 20 years and still were getting tons of money, but um, an investment. But typically what we're going to look at is at the very top, I'm going to have my income, my revenue streams, what my projection is for those. And then I'm going to have my cost of goods, my cost of sale, and then underneath that, my fixed costs. And then I'm going to be able to map out um, when I think I'll become profitable and how profitable I think I can become. Um, the, at this point in your business, it's going to be a guess. And over time, it will get better and better until you make major changes and then you'll be guessing again. Okay, so here's our business model canvas. We've talked about both sides of it. And again, do you now see how the value proposition is the piece that ties the cost center and the profits together? Because in order for people to buy what you sell, they have to see value. So this is again, where we talk about who do I sell it to? How do I solve it? Or what is my customer's problem in their words? How do I solve it? And then I need to understand, of course, what are going to be the costs associated with solving it? And why am I the best solution for my ideal customer? And if I understand my ideal customer and how I solve their problem, then I can start thinking about how that's going to bring in revenue. So that's how this baby all fits together and why we have value proposition in the middle. So if you have not started your business model canvas, this is your next, this is your next step. And to make sure it's one page and high level, very concise, and the last word is important, very precise. Be very thoughtful about exactly what you mean because other people are going to read it and try and understand it. And you're going to try and remember what you meant. And your team's going to try and make decisions around it. So being very concise and very precise is important. I think that's all I have. So I'm open to any questions or if you want to share some of the comments, I'm happy to um, open the floor for that. I can stop sharing my screen if you want. Um, I'm going to put my, leave my, my contact information up here for a minute. Um, find me on LinkedIn. I love to connect with entrepreneurs. Um, if you'd like, if you have questions and you want to talk to me, you're welcome to do that. Reach out um, on LinkedIn. Tell me how you met me and I'd be happy to answer some of your questions. Liz, uh, as always, thank you so much. Very well done. Really appreciate you. And so uh, we will open this up for uh, any questions on any further questions online. And of course, you are welcome, as Liz said, you are welcome to connect with her at uh, some point on LinkedIn as well. I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. I'm glad it was helpful. Um, I think, uh, Richard, yes, all of your revenue streams need to be validated. Absolutely. Um, and, and that's another part of the discussion is how do you validate your ideas? And, yeah. and I'm not sure, Logan, I don't know if I'm doing that or somebody else is doing it. I can't remember what I'm doing this time. We do have some on that. And I think I've even given presentations on, on that as well. Um, so in some form or another, we will have that information and have a session on that. Um, and we also, we have sessions in our other programs on that topic as well. So absolutely, that is a very important topic and we do address that and will it continue to do so. I don't know entirely what the schedule is for Founders University, but we will have a session out at some point about that. Um, Robert, yes, you know, connect, uh, connect with Liz on LinkedIn. Um, that'll be a great way to connect with her. Um, where can we find some completed docs to reference? Ben, Ben, are you are you talking about um, like strategizer docs or like examples of companies like fill, filling out a business model canvas? Uh, companies filling out a canvas. There are actually actually, and then Liz, please, uh, you know, correct correct me if I'm wrong. I've seen some really excellent ones on YouTube and at various other accelerators of them going through a scenario with the business model canvas. And then th there was another question about how often do you revisit? I really believe that your strategy, whatever it is, is a working strategy and it always needs to be iterated. So I think that, you know, if you did a once a month, check back real quick, 15 minutes, look through it, see if you've thought of anything or forgotten anything. But as a team, you know, a quarterly review is not a bad idea. How are, are we making progress? Um, especially as you get into more details. Oh, great, Kara, thanks for adding the example. Um, so I don't think you ever create a strategy and put it on the shelf. That's why I don't create 50 page strategies because they're worthless. It needs to be something that is, you know, leave it on your desk, tape it to your desk. So it's always right there. Um, pull it up, have it as the back is your screen saver on your, your computer. This is how you're running your business. Change it when it needs to be changed, live it, 
think it, remind yourself, this is how successful companies function. Yes, excellent. Uh, very good point. It's a, it's a, it's a dynamic uh, business and particularly startups this early are very dynamic and setting it in stone is not a way to uh, progress effectively. <laughs> Robert, on, pay, on, on a 12-page deck, how many max number of appendix pages should be in there to clarify if needed for viewers? Um, Liz, please feel free to answer this. And of course, I'll give my two cents if you don't mind as well. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think there's a magic number uh, oh, of appendix. As many as you need. Yeah. Right? That's my answer is as many as you need. But remember too that um, who's looking at it? How are they looking at it? Just because you made a deck for one purpose doesn't mean it's the right deck for another purpose. So as you're thinking about what appendix, what appendices do I need? Who's reading it? What are they reading it for? Are they reading it to coach me? Are they reading it to invest in me? Are they reading it to partner with me? Are they reading it because you want them to become an employee? You need to figure out who's looking at it and then what things will they need more in-depth explanation of? So really, those are, they serve the purpose of answering the questions in more depth than your, however many, I don't remember how many pages we have in a 12-page deck. Um, this is the, the, these extra pages are to expand. They're not, no one may look at them at all. So. Yeah, excellent, Liz. Uh, to totally agree. Couldn't agree more. That's how you want to do it. Liz, any insight you can offer on that is excellent. Uh, projections are always an important thing to have. Um, anything that helps them understand that you understand your cost of doing business um, is important. Um, beyond that, it, it you know it completely depends upon your business. If you're if you've explained what problem you solve and you don't feel that you have space to dive into the technology and how it works, you might want a slide that shows how it works later on. Um, you may not need a technology slide at all because your technology may be sufficient. Your explanation may be sufficient. The, the investors are going to want answers to questions that help them decide whether or not you are going to be successful. So if you can't explain how your technology works in one slide, then you better have an extra slide or two that explains it. If you can't explain your cost of good in one slide, then you better have another one because they're not going to invest in you unless they believe that you fully understand what it's going to take to be successful. And, and here's the, the thing. Um, most investors don't invest in technology. I, Logan, I don't know if you guys have shared this with them before. Investors don't invest in technology. They invest in people with ideas. And so I don't care how good your technology is, how amazing, earth-shattering, life-changing, world-shaking it's going to be. If you don't demonstrate how, an understanding of how you're going to sell it, what your market is, what your go-to-market strategy is, what your costs are going to be, if you can't do all of that, um, really explain why, who your ideal customer is, why it's going to work, they're not going to invest in you because you're just going to be another one of a gazillion people with an idea. Superb guidance from a, a comment from David. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, David. Okay, well, I, I'll let you guys go. If you want to reach out to me, please do. I'm happy to talk to anybody who, any of you that have a question or want to connect. Excellent. Liz, again, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. As always, uh, outstanding and superb, as David put it as well. So again, thank you. Okay, you guys have a great day. You as well. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us.